well, I guess I'm going to have to wait till I get to heaven before I can sing, because I don't have any singing ability. But we sure had a great concert here this morning, didn't we? Now, um, <clears throat> I think it's Mr. Woods. Is that Mr. Woods? Mr. Woods and two deacons are going to guard the doors because nobody is leaving until after I finish talking about Adventist education. There's Mr. Wood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, advance the slide. Next slide, please. Um, could you go back one, please? All right. Has anybody seen this um, video called The Blueprint, The Story of Adventist Education? Can I see your hands if you have? Okay, we don't have too many people who have seen it, so our principal, Mrs. Cuevas, maybe we should have a time when on a Saturday afternoon or Saturday night we can see the film. Now, why was this film made? It was because a documentary filmmaker, not an Adventist, uh, found out about our school system, that is our K-12 school system. And uh, he saw an article written in the Christian Science Monitor that in fact I had written about a study that we had engaged in. And he called me up one day and he said, say, let's talk about that. It sounds like quite an extraordinary story and maybe somebody should make a film about it. Now, if you haven't seen it, you need to know about it. And you need to see it. So why did Adventist education back then get um, media attention? Could you show me the next slide? Martin Dobemeyer was the filmmaker. And uh, he said, well, let's make a film. And I said, fine, here are the names of the schools that I want you to include in the film. And Martin said to me, Alyssa, this is a documentary. You can't tell me what should be in the, the film. But he said, but what you can do is you can give me the names of schools, and I'll go out and do some scouting. So this involved all the schools in the North American Division and in Canada. So I held my breath while Martin was out there scouting. And after several months, he came back to me, and he said, Alyssa, you have real stars out there. And I said, what do you mean, Martin? He said, your teachers and your principals are fantastic. I've never seen such committed, dedicated educators before. So um, next slide, please. So what, what did Martin get excited about? He got so excited about a study that was called Cognitive Genesis. And I happened to be the project director for that study. And so I want to share with you um, the results of that. Now, how did that study come about? It came about because when I was dean of the School of Education at La Sierra University, a parent came to me and said, I think I'm going to uh, move my, my, my child from the Adventist school to a non-Adventist school. And I said, why are you going to do that? And the parents said to me, well, I just sort of feel like they're not getting a quality education. And I said, do you have any evidence for that? And the parents said, no. Do you? And I had to say, guess what? No, I didn't have any concrete data, findings, evidence that showed the kind of education we were delivering at our schools. Hence, cognitive genesis. So it was a four-year study of all the schools in the North American division, and that inc included your school here. So next slide, please. 800 plus schools, all the students in the schools, grades three through nine and 11, all the parents also participated, and the teachers and principals at the participating schools. So what were the results? Next slide, please. Students in Adventist schools outperformed the national average on standardized tests. 
These were tests that were taken by millions of people. And they did what? They outperformed the national average. Now, um, I know we're in church, but we could say hallelujah, amen. Um, they outperformed, that is, they scored higher than most of the students taking, at least 50% of the students taking the same test. Next slide, please. And they did that in all subjects and in all grade levels. All subjects and in all grade levels. Is this sinking in? Yes? OK, all grade levels, all subjects, they scored above the national average. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, they scored above their predicted expected achievement. So I have to explain this with my hands. I haven't figured out yet how to do this. So let's say Joey's ability is here. Every teacher and principal wants Joey's achievement to be here, even with his ability. But in our schools, in Adventist schools, the achievement is above. So they achieve above their ability. Not just in one subject, but in all subjects, for all grade levels, for all school sizes, regardless of the ability level. Isn't that pretty good? Yes, I see somebody back here saying yes. That's OK, next, next slide, please. So we like to call them overachievers. Next slide. Now, here's the remarkable thing about the students in our schools. They not only increased in achievement, but they increased in ability. And educators will tell you that usually ability doesn't increase that much. Maybe it might go up a little. But basically, it stays about the same. But in Adventist schools, the kids increase in ability. And uh, <clears throat> the makers of the test, of the ability test, came to me and said, what are you guys doing in Adventist schools where your students increase in ability? And guess what I had to say to them? I don't know. I don't know why they're increasing in ability. Next slide, please. So if I were to ask you, though, this question, is there an academic advantage to Adventist education? Based on the information I've given you this morning, what would you say? Yes. OK, some of you are paying attention. OK, next slide. I'd say absolutely yes. OK, or in Spanish, my Spanish students taught me to say, claro que sí, right? OK, um, next slide, please. Now, school size. We have a small school here at Laguna Niguel, yes? But guess what we discovered in the study? There, were very, there was very little difference between large schools, medium schools, small schools. But when there was a difference, the difference was in favor of what? The small school. Doesn't that make sense? I kind of think that here in America with big cars, big, um, what are the TV sets, the monitors, you know, big things, that we've forgotten that great things, good things, can come in small packages. And based on the data that we had, the kids in small schools did better than those in um, larger schools. So don't be concerned if the school is small. They're sort of getting tutorial and extra, um, extra help in a small school. Next slide, please. OK, so the question is, what is happening in our schools to help present these, to help uh, get these results? And one of the things that we need to think about is that Adventist education takes a holistic approach. That is, it looks at the physical, the mental, the social, and emotional. But encompassing all of that is what? Is the spiritual. OK, somehow the spiritual, not somehow, remove somehow. The spiritual infuses all the other areas that um, your children are exposed to during 
the day, so the physical, the mental, and social, emotional. So the spiritual is infusing all of that, and we call that the holistic approach to Adventist education. Next slide, please. Now, parents have asked, what difference does it make if my child goes to an Adventist school? They go to church on Sabbath, they might even go to um, prayer meeting, and they participate in Pathfinders. What difference does that make? And, you know, we don't have a lot of studies on correlating, looking at what's the relationship between academics and spiritual emphasis. But we had one student, a graduate student, called, <coughs> excuse me, Marianne Gilbert, who did a study using our data. And here's what she found. Next, next slide. She found that when there, was the, when there were these things present, when the student was in a school where spirituality and religion emphasized in the school, when the teacher was spiritual and when the mother was spiritual, when you had those three factors operating, the children had 8.5 months gain in academics. So Mrs. Cuevas will tell you what that means later on, because it's quite a lot, 8.5. Okay, that's 8.5 months ahead of where they should be. But notice the three things that are operating there. So I like to tease the fathers and ask them how come they're not in this equation. We have to, we have to work on that. Oh, oh, okay. Maybe so. We have to, we've got to test that, though. We've got to test that. All right, next slide, please. All right, now, in another study that a colleague of mine did called Value Genesis, the results I showed you prior to this are cognitive genesis. This is Value Genesis. He found that 81% of all the students say this, attending an Adventist school is the most important thing that has helped me develop my religious faith. Okay, next slide. Now, um, this is a statistic from general society, but I think it's important for us to realize that 22% of middle and high school students thought that caring for others was, more important, was not more important than their personal happiness or individual achievement. Do you understand that? They thought, what's more important is me, and I don't care about others. Um, I would say that that's a fairly negative take um, if we think about our society and where it's going. Now, when this statistic came out, British Columbia, the educators in British Columbia said, we don't want a society where people don't care about one another. So they said, let's look at our curriculum and revise it so that we can emphasize caring for others as a major component in our education system. So they did that, and they implemented it, and a year later, well, they tested and then they retested just a year later, and they found improvement in caring for others. So it's not that difficult to, have, to do, but I would say to you that in our schools, this is a natural component about caring for others. That's what the Bible emphasizes. That's what Jesus emphasized. Next slide, please. So my, my question to you is, I asked you, is there an academic advantage? Is there a spiritual advantage to Adventist education? I got some people paying, paying attention here in the front row here. Okay, okay, very good. Next slide. All right, so we have another absolutely yes. Next slide. All right, so now I got these results from Cognitive Genesis and these other studies, and we're asking ourselves why. What is the reason? Is there a reason? Can we pinpoint something that's happening in our Adventist schools that accounts for this academic achievement? Um, 
Next slide. I'd like to talk now about worldview because a bunch of us have studied this and we're going to look at worldview as a possible reason for what is happening in our school. George Barna found that before the age of 18, 64% or two out of three accept Christ. By the age of 13, notice, by the age of 13, young persons have already developed their worldview. By the age of 13, okay, next slide. So the question is, what is worldview? If a child has developed, has developed the worldview by the age of 13, it's not fully developed but they've chosen a worldview, not consciously perhaps. What is worldview and what difference is it gonna make in their life? Next slide. Worldview is the operating system we use to navigate life. A set of ideas and beliefs and attitudes about the world that govern our thoughts, decisions, and actions. Next slide. It's the lens through which we see life. You don't consciously say, I have this worldview, but how you look at life, your attitudes, the decisions you make, tell someone this is your worldview. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'd like to propose four major worldviews. At the top, there's others first, then we have rules first, me first and feelings first. So if you consider these four worldviews, notice I have intersecting circles because in most cases, they're a combination worldviews. We might not be all others first. We would hope that we could be, but there's some other things operating. Church people, <clears throat> excuse me, church people frequently are rules first. Does that make sense to you? Are rules first. Now, being rules first is not bad if you're only, if you're, but if you're only rules first, it may not be so good, okay? Would you like to mix that up maybe with others first? The results would be different. Next slide, please. So let's look at what Philippians says, two, three to four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What worldview is that? What, a, what worldview is that? Others first. This is others first. Okay? This is others first right out of the Bible. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay. Let's take a look at the four worldviews that I uh, indicated earlier. So we have feelings first, rules first, me first, and others first. This is the decision-making process that brain scientists have uh, outlined for us. So there's a problem and a need, then we gather some information to make a solution, then we may act or not act, and then we have an outcome. But notice, our worldview affects those steps in the decision-making process. So imagine a problem that you approach just for feelings first, or would you do rules first, or me first, or others first. That affects what happens in all the blocks after that in the decision-making process. Next slide. So here's the question. Can, stu can a student's worldview predict increase in achievement and abilities? Okay, this is what we looked at. We wanted to find out what is it, why is it our students are doing so well in Adventist education? And we focused on worldview and did our studies and collected data on worldview. So can a student's worldview predict increase in ability and achievement. Um, I don't know about you, but I like to be able to predict. And 
Let's see what happens. Next slide. Here was our hypothesis. Bear with me as I read it. We hypothesize a positive and significant relationship between the degree of others-oriented decision-making or worldview, that's the other's worldview, and academic outcomes among students. This relationship, this is what we're saying, this relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, suggests that the students who more strongly consider others in their decision-making are likely to exhibit better academic performance. That was a little lengthy, but did you get it? Okay, yeah, I have a good audience here. I have an intelligent group here. So if you're others first, if the student is others first, the likelihood is that their achievement will be better because of that. Next slide. So we developed a worldview inventory, a questionnaire that indicates whether a student is others first, rules first, me first, or feelings first. And um, next slide. So we had the study called Optimizing Student Growth. Test them in MAP. Um, that's the test that they're all given, right, Mrs. Cuevas? Okay, MAP. And then we also did a, an abilities test. Then we did WIN, which was the inventory to determine what their worldview was. And uh, we looked to see what happened with that. So I want to show you some preliminary results from a school that did just this. Next slide, please. Students that were rule-oriented, that's the red pencil there, okay, for look to see how they did compared to all the other groups in language, reading, math, and science. And what would you say they did? Did they do better or worse? They did worse, okay? The red pencil is lower. They did worse than all the other students, okay? Um, and this was at a significant level. So let's go to the next slide, please. Now look at those who are others-oriented. They're the blue pencil, language, reading, math, and science. And what did they do? Did they do better or worse? They did better, okay? They did better. Now, this is on a test that Mrs. Cuevas administers to her kids three times a year, the MAP test, three times a year. So we took their MAP test, not, not yours specifically, and then we did the WIN inventory, and we looked to see what kind of worldview did the student have and how did the student do academically on the MAP test? So there is a relationship. Our hypothesis is showing that, yes, there is a positive relationship between worldview and academic achievement. Next, please. I want to explain to you why we think some of this is happening. Yes, we have good teachers. And yes, they're teaching well. And we have good students. You know, however, what is happening in the brain here? Um, my husband is a neuroscientist. He's a neuroradiologist. And one day he came home and he said to me, Alyssa, you have to find out about mirror neurons. And I said, what about mirror neurons? I'd never heard the term before. He said, here, and he handed me a book. Actually, he handed me two books. He said, read up about it because this is the difference that, this is making a difference in your schools. Okay, so what are mirror neurons? Next slide. When one observes an action or an emotion, it automatically triggers, automatically triggers a mirroring behavior of that emotion or action. Okay, notice the little baby imitating the adult there. Okay, next slide. So we mentally imitate every action we witness prompting us to yawn or dance or grieve or sing with others. So um, I used to think that 
when someone was yawning and I yawned after them that there was something in the air, you know, that made me yawn. But it wasn't something in the air. It is the mirror neurons in our brain. Okay, next slide. So my question is, at our schools, are we mirroring Christ's behavior in all the things that we're doing? When somebody comes to our campus, okay, can we see Christ? Do we see Christ in the behavior, the actions, the language, the conversations on campus? Are our students seeing that? Are they seeing Christ? Next slide. Someone said this a while ago, but I think it still holds. The overarching purpose of our school, the macro effect when it's all said and done, is to give our youth a Christian worldview, to see everything from God's point of view as revealed in his inspired word. It's giving our students a Christian mind, teaching them how to think Christian. Next slide. So my, the title of my presentation is The Tree of Life. <clears throat> Many years ago, at our small school in Simi Valley, there was a teaching principal there, kind of like, <clears throat> excuse me, like Ms. Cuevas. His name was Norman Edwards. And at the end, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of every school year, he would call his students together and he'd say, okay, this is the last time we're going to get together as a class. And he said, some of you are graduating, some of you are moving away. This is eighth grade. And he said, we may never see each other, but I'd like you to make a commitment. <clears throat> and they said, what's that? What's a commitment? And Mr. Edwards said, it's a promise that you're going to make if you want to make it. I'd like you to make a commitment that you will meet me and your classmates at the Tree of Life. Now, he said, there are going to be a lot of people there at the Tree of Life. So let's meet at the south side of the Tree of Life. So when I have students, I don't have them now, but when I did, I'd say, OK, everybody, Mr. Edwards has all his students meeting on the south side of the Tree of Life. Let's meet on the west side. Next slide. What's the ultimate advantage of Adventist education? It's educating for eternity. We've talked about the benefits of academics, the benefits of spiritual things, but ultimately, this is it, everybody educating for eternity. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that I'm uh, biased. I am biased for Adventist education. And I'm going to give you a specific example of somebody that I live with, my husband. My husband had Adventist education from grade one through medical school. And um, <clears throat> his parents were very poor early on, because during World War II, they were sent to concentration camps. But when they came back to California, the church said, we will help support your two children so that they can go to Adventist school. So my husband had Adventist school from grade one through medical school. And do you know where his first job was? His first job was at Harvard University. Now, I tell you that not to say, oh, great, for your husband, but to tell you that those of us parents that I know who think because my child goes to an Adventist school, they won't be able to achieve great things. They won't be able to go on to great graduate school. They won't ha have the opportunities. And so here's somebody strictly Adventist education, started life not speaking English, but speaking Japanese, and he his first job was at Harvard. So um, I have always felt, because I was not raised in Adventist, I, was, I always felt that I was racing behind him to catch up. He was so far ahead of me. And he could place things in a large perspective. 
given his knowledge of prophecy and of the Bible. I've gotten a little closer to him, but uh, I'm not quite there yet. But I think it was because of his Adventist education while he was, <clears throat> excuse me, while he was young. So parents, if you are considering to put your child in an Adventist school, don't, don't consider anymore. Take that step. And as Mrs. Cueva said earlier, there's a 50% scholarship available for first-time students, right? And I'm sure there are other scholarships available. But you don't want to not let your child miss this opportunity for eternity.